the words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians, the fourth chapter and the sixth verse. The sixth verse in the fourth chapter of Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The Apostle here, as you remember from the reading at the beginning, gives us one of those few autobiographical passages that are to be found in his various writings. He refers to himself and to his own ministry, and he had a special reason for doing so. However, what is of interest to us is that in doing that, he seems once more to give us an account of his own conversion and of that great and dramatic and remarkable thing that happened to him as he was traveling down from Jerusalem to Damascus. Now, many of us have been considering together the, this great question of the conversion of this apostle for a number of Sunday nights. We have been doing so in order that we might learn from it the nature of conversion the principles that govern it, in order that we may test and examine ourselves and in order that we may know certainly and of a surety that what happened to him has happened to us. So we've analyzed it, we've taken it in detail. We've considered the hindrances and the obstacles to conversion. We have considered the central vital thing itself, which means meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have also considered some of the consequences of that, because the scriptures are very careful to provide us with a number of tests which we can apply to ourselves in order that we may know for certain whether we are truly Christian or not. The Bible has a great deal to tell us of what it calls false spirits. Uh, we are told not to trust every spirit, but to test the spirits in order to discover whether they are truly of God. There are even false Christs, it tells us, anti-Christs, those who, in a way, profess the name of Christ, but essentially deny him. So we are told to prove all things and to hold fast only to that which is good. And as I say, we have been trying to do this in detail. Now, having done that, it seemed to me that it would be a very good thing for us once more to look at it as a whole, lest we become lost in the various details. And here, in this statement, not only in this sixth verse, but in the verses really that lead up to it, the Apostle again gives us a view of it. He gives us a description of it. Of course, it was something that he never forgot. It was such a vital turning point in his life and in his story. This man, you remember, who had been brought up as a Pharisee and who'd had the very best training that a Pharisee could ever have, this man who'd excelled all others in his knowledge of the law and in his zeal for the law and, as he thought, his zeal for God, this man who had hated the name of Christ and who'd hated Christianity, and who'd hated the Christian church and Christian people, and who imagined that he was doing God's service by trying to destroy them. You remember this man, this persecuting Jew, this arrogant Pharisee, this man who'd gone to the authorities and asked for letters, giving him the right to go down to Damascus to apprehend and to arrest the Christians worshipping there, in order that he might bring them to trial and to destruction. You remember how he sets off upon his journey, breathing out threatenings and slaughter, in a mad fury against Christ and his message. But you remember how on that road, 
He there, suddenly about noonday, saw that light in the heaven above the brightest shining of the sun and saw the face of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And how he fell on his back to the ground in helplessness and uttered his famous words, Who art thou, Lord? And how the answer came back, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And then he said, What wilt thou have me to do, Lord? And the reply came back, You must go to Damascus, and then it shall be told thee what thou shalt do. And you remember that in all that we saw that we are face to face with this climactic, dramatic event which took place in this man's experience and turned him right round and sent him off as the greatest preacher and evangelist of the gospel that the church and the world have ever known. Well now, I say, it's not surprising that this man from time to time looks back upon that. And here he's doing that very thing in this verse that we're looking at this evening. This is why he says, I'm preaching because of what God has done to me. Because God has given given me this knowledge, he's made me a Christian and has sent me out to tell others about it. Now, you notice that in giving an account of this great event, In describing his conversion, in telling us what it is that has happened to him, the apostle makes use of two pictures. The first picture he makes use of, obviously, is the one to which I've just been, to that which happened to him himself on the road to Damascus. The light shining upon the darkness. The knowledge of the glory of God, yes, In the face of Jesus Christ. He never forgot that face. Everything had come to him through the face of Jesus Christ. He saw the risen Lord. It wasn't a vision. It was an exceptional view of the risen glorified Lord that was given to this man in order that he might be an apostle. And in order that he thereby might be a witness of the resurrection. It wasn't a a vision, I say. He really did see the face of Jesus Christ. And he refers to that here. He puts it partly then in terms of his experience on the road to Damascus. The light shining and the face, the face of Jesus Christ. But you notice that he couples with it another idea. And the two things, of course, are very similar. The thing he couples with it, of course, is an account of the creation of the world. He says, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. Now that takes us back, doesn't it, to the very beginning of the book of Genesis, where you read this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good and divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. That is the beginning of the account of the creation of the world. God commanded the light. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And that was the first move, the first step in the entire creation of the world. Now you see in this verse that we are considering tonight, the apostle in giving an account of himself as a Christian and in telling us as to how it was that he became a Christian, takes those two ideas, his own experience on the road to Damascus and that which happened at the creation of the world at the very beginning and he blends them together. And through this double picture, 
He gives us this very vivid representation and portrayal of what it is that happens when a man becomes a Christian. Now, I want to consider it with you in the light of this picture. You see, the controlling idea, again, is this. The apostle wants to give us an impression of the profundity of the change. Oh, to become a Christian is a very profound thing. Oh, to become a Christian is not a superficial thing. It's not an easy thing. It isn't something that happens on the surface. It is the profoundest change that can ever take place in anybody's life and experience. Now, the apostle not only says that here, he says it everywhere else. You see, according to this apostolic teaching, and it's exactly the same in the teaching of all the other biblical writers, when a man becomes a Christian, when one is taken from the world into the church, if you like, when one ceases to be an unbeliever and becomes a believer, what takes place is as big and as profound as this, that nothing less then an idea of creation is adequate to convey the idea. The apostle goes on using this same figure, you remember, in the next chapter, in the 17th verse of the 5th chapter of this epistle, he says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And some would prefer to translate it, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. And it's exactly what our Lord, you remember, said to Nicodemus. You must be born again. You must be regenerated. Now, I say that becoming a Christian, therefore, must never be thought of as something which is superficial, and merely a step, a simple step which someone takes. Becoming really a Christian is comparable to a creation. The action of God when he made the world out of nothing and said, let there be light. So that again, you see, as we examine ourselves, we must do so in the light of some such statement as that. Are we aware of a working of God within us which reminds us of the very creation of the world? Are we aware that there is something about us and which differentiates us from those who don't claim to be Christian, which can only be described adequately in terms of this, that God who made the world out of nothing and commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts, has done something comparable. Now we spent an evening a few Sunday nights ago in considering Paul's astonishment. It's all here again, isn't it? I say again, my friends, that unless we are astonished at what we are, unless we are astonished at what God has done to us, I would suggest that we exa again examine the foundations and make sure whether we are Christian at all. The apostle says, this is it, this is what has happened to me. It's the same God who acted like that who's acted in me. And I am what I am because of God, that God has done this too. Well, now then, very well, let us take this great conception. This uh, profound change which takes place in the soul and makes it Christian. And let us try to measure it in terms of this picture. What is it the apostle is really teaching us? Well, I think that you'll agree with me that we can deduce the following very legitimately. Indeed, we are driven to do so. He first of all presents us in this picture with the state of men by nature. He first of all gives us a representation of man as he is born into this world and without the effect of the gospel upon him. And you notice that with regard to that he's got two things to say. The first thing he tells us about men by nature is that he's in a state of darkness and he is in a state of ignorance. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness or if you like into the darkness 
light darkness hath shined, he says, into our hearts. What for? To give the light of the knowledge. Knowledge as over against ignorance. Now there, I say, is the basic postulate of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Men by nature, untouched and unaffected by the gospel, by the power of God in the gospel, is in a state of darkness, is in a state of ignorance. Take up the other comparison, if you like, the creation of the world. Man as he is by nature is exactly as the world was before God said, let there be light. Darkness, we are told, brooded over the face of the deep. It was a state of chaos, a state of darkness, a complete absence of light. Now, obviously, it is very fundamental that we should be clear about this. And we have no excuse if we are not clear about it, because the Bible is full of this sort of teaching. How frequently does it represent the coming of the gospel, the coming of Christ into the world in terms of light? Go back to the beginning of your gospels and you'll find that it puts it like this. The people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. There's the idea. Sitting in darkness and they see the light. This self-same apostle tells us that those that be drunken are be drunken in the night. The Bible talks about the hidden work of, works of darkness. We read in the third chapter of John, this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You've got it everywhere. Light and darkness. It's always this comparison of the creation. The first step in which is the coming of the light and the separating of the day and the night. Well, now, what does it mean by this picture? When I say that man, as he is by nature, is in a state of darkness and in a state of ignorance, what exactly do I mean? Well, let me put it in this form. Man is in a state of spiritual ignorance. Obviously, man has a great deal of knowledge. Man knows many things. Our world is full of books, it's full of people who are reading, and everybody is out for information and knowledge and instruction. There's a great deal of knowledge in the world. The Bible doesn't dispute that, it doesn't deny that. It has nothing to say against scientific development and advance. It has nothing to say about the increase in culture and in knowledge. It grants it all, it admits it all. But what it does say from beginning to end is this. That however much men may know and however great the knowledge that he is amassed, left to himself and until he becomes a Christian, he is in a state of spiritual ignorance and darkness. He has no light at all. About what? Well, here are some of the things. According to the Bible, a man who is not a Christian really is in the dark and is ignorant about himself and about his own true nature. He's ignorant even about men. And I suggest to you that this is something which is very obvious in this modern world of ours. Take the average conception of men and as to what man is. How do we think of men instinctively? What is the view of men taken by the vast majority of people in the world tonight? And I'm not merely thinking of those people who never use their minds at all and who live simply as animals to eat and drink and things like that. I'm thinking of the best thinkers. What is their view of men? Well, they leave out the highest and the greatest thing in men, which is his soul, his spirit. There is an ignorance and a darkness about the very nature and being and constitution of men. Man is regarded as an animal. He is regarded as a reasoning animal, a clever animal, an animal that's developed a little bit more than the other animals, but they stop at the animal level and at the animal conception. And the real tragedy and the essence of the trouble in the world tonight is that man doesn't realize the truth about himself. 
He thinks of himself as just a creature who is nothing but a conglomeration of lusts and passions and desires. He's interested in eating and drinking and pleasure. He wants certain things. That's his view of himself. And because that is his view of himself, he lives as he does. The explanation of the sin and the shame and the trouble in the world tonight is finally man's totally inadequate realization of the truth about himself. Oh, my dear friends, if men only knew what man is, there'd never be another war. If man only saw himself as he was made by God and as the Bible depicts him, he'd never be taking life as he does. Men wouldn't deal with one another as they do. Life wouldn't be in the chaotic condition it is if man only realized the truth about man. But that's the final tragedy. And what makes it a tragedy, of course, is this. What really heightens the tragedy is that man, in his blindness and in his ignorance, thinks that he's got a marvelous new conception of man, superior to that of the Bible. And he ridicules the Bible and he laughs at it as something that keeps a man down and keeps him as a child. The fact of the matter is that there is no view or conception of men in the world tonight that anywhere approaches the biblical view, which tells us that man is made in the image of God, fashioned and patterned after God himself, whatever that may mean in detail. Man is a creature made by God and meant for God and meant for correspondence with God, made the Lord of the creation, meant to live as a prince. But how different is the view of the average person of men tonight? Why? Well, he's ignorant about men. He's in darkness about his own constitution, his own being, his own nature. And because of that initial misconception, of course, he is equally ignorant about his life in this world and about the purpose of life in this world. Have you ever stopped for a moment and sat down and asked yourself these questions? What is life? What's it for? What's it mean? What's it all about? What's it designed unto? Now I say that the man who is not a Christian is in darkness about that. He very rarely stops even to consider it. He just goes on from hour to hour and from day to day and never looks at himself from the outside and asks himself, well, what is it all about? Why am I here and what am I meant to be? He's in ignorance about that. He doesn't even consider it. And going along still further, we see his appalling ignorance about God and about man's relationship to God. Paul says here that when he became a Christian, what happened to him was that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God came to him. And is there anything more appalling than this? The ignorance of mankind of God and of the glory of God. What does the man who's not a Christian know about God? He simply mentions the name of God to swear, to curse, to blaspheme. It's a word that he uses without thinking. What does he really know about God? The psalmist says the heavens declare the glory of God. Does man without Christ see it? Does he see God and the knowledge of God and the glory of God everywhere in creation, round and about him? The great, almighty, eternal God who sits upon the universe and who controls everything. What does man, who is not a Christian, know about this God? Yea, let me ask another question. What does he care about this God? That's the darkness I'm speaking about. That's the ignorance which I'm trying to emphasize. Think of the teeming masses of men and women in this world this evening who are passing their time in sheer pleasure, in animal enjoyment, and things even worse. Think of them. There they are, with a never a thought about God. Never a moment given to contemplation of Him, this great, eternal, almighty being. They live as if He was not, and as if He didn't exist at all. Their appalling ignorance and darkness of men with respect to God. 
Is it surprising that the apostle uses these terms, darkness and ignorance? And then, of course, added to this comes the next thing inevitably, man's eternal destiny. He doesn't know himself. He doesn't see the meaning of life. He's forgotten God, and obviously, therefore, he's utterly in the dark as to his own destiny. And the end of life in this world, and death, and what lies beyond it. Am I exaggerating when I say that this is the cause of the trouble that man is in ignorance and darkness about these things? Do you ask me to believe that the average person would go on living as he does if he really understood that it is appointed unto men once to die and after death the judgment? Does man really know that when he ends this life in this world and shuffles off this mortal coil that he'll stand before his maker and creator in a final judgment and that there is an eternal destiny awaiting him on the one side or on the other. Is the world aware of that? Could the world go on living as it does if it did know that? My dear friends, there is no answer. Man is in a state of gross darkness. He is ignorant, unutterably ignorant, about these most vital things. Oh, I know he has this amazing knowledge about the atom. He understands philosophy and various other things. But what boots it all when with regard to these things he's in gross darkness and in appalling ignorance? I am asserting this, I say, once more on the authority of the Bible. Not only about those who obviously never take any trouble at all to think, but even about the best and the highest thinkers of the world. Have you ever heard the story, I wonder, of something that happened here in London about 150 years ago? There was a great prime minister in this country in those days, and his name was William Pitt the Younger. He had a very great friend called William Wilberforce, the great pioneer and leader in the anti-slavery movement, the abolition of slavery. You remember the name. William Wilberforce, as you know, was a, a great Christian man who had undergone this vital experience of conversion, who had seen himself as a sinner, and who had seen that his only hope was to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and his work for him. He was a great Christian man. He was a great and lifelong friend of William Pitt, the Prime Minister. William Pitt was a formal Christian, by which I mean that he went to the house of God now and again, as such great men so often do, on state occasions and things like that. But he hadn't the vital experience of his friend, William Wilberforce. On one occasion, Wilberforce took William Pitt to listen to a certain preacher who then preached here in London called Richard Cecil. Nothing gave Wilberforce greater delight than to listen to Cecil because of his spiritual preaching, because of his outlining of the gospel and its mighty works. And he was so anxious that his friend, the Prime Minister, should go and listen to Cecil. He'd often asked him, and somehow there was always an excuse. But at last the day came when William Pitt said he'd go, and he went with, with William Wilberforce to listen to Richard Cecil. And Wilberforce was delighted, and that morning, as it, would have, as it happened to be, Cecil was preaching at his very best and outlining the glories and the wonders of this great salvation. And Wilberforce's heart was ravished and his mind was delighted. And he wondered what was happening to his friend, the great Prime Minister. They got eventually out of the service 
But before William Wilberforce had an opportunity of saying anything to William Pitt, Pitt said to Wilberforce, You know, Wilberforce, he said, I did my best to listen to that man. I rarely did concentrate with the whole of my being. But you know, he said, I haven't the slightest idea as to what he's been talking about. Need I explain what I mean? You can be a very great man and a very great prime minister, yet you can be spiritually dead and suffering from gross darkness and complete ignorance of spiritual truth. No doubt Pitt in many ways was an abler man and a bigger man than William Wilberforce. But when you come face to face with these things, Wilberforce had light and knowledge. Pitt was in darkness and utter ignorance. And that's the only distinction the Bible is interested in. And its proclamation is that man as he is by nature is blind, is dark, is ignorant. He doesn't know these things. He doesn't take an interest in them. They mean nothing to him. They're boring to him. He doesn't know what the preacher is talking about. Ignorance and darkness. And perhaps supremely ignorant of this. That he is blinded by the God of this world and held in slavery and serfdom by him. And that all his vaunted freedom and liberty is nothing but a liberty within the limits imposed upon him by the God of this world of whom the apostle here speaks. Well, that's the first thing. Let me hurry to the second thing. The second thing, of course, that characterizes men by nature in the light of this illustration, this picture, is obviously chaos. We read there at the beginning of Genesis that the world was without form and void. It was in a chaotic condition. Matter, as it then existed, had no order and no arrangement whatsoever. It was without form. It was absolutely void, empty in that sense. And the apostle uses this particular picture and illustration in order to convey that truth to us concerning man as he is in life in this world without the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let me put it bluntly in a phrase. Life without Christ is chaos. It's just chaotic. Now, can I substantiate that statement? Well, I suggest to you that I can. To start with, it has no form whatsoever. It has no shape. There is no order, there is no arrangement about it. And as you look at life today, and as you read your newspapers and your books and your journals, doesn't that shout at you? Don't you get this impression that the people are indeed, as the scriptures put it elsewhere, using a different picture, as sheep without a shepherd, there doesn't seem to be any purpose. Everything seems to be aimless. Let us eat, drink, and be merry. They say, for tomorrow we die. They've got no purpose in life. They've got no direction. They've got no objective. There isn't a shape to the life of the non-Christian. He doesn't know what's happening. He doesn't understand it, and nobody else can. Life without Christ is self-contradictory. People defend themselves at one point and then go and deny that very thing at another point. They condemn certain people for doing certain things. They don't see that they do it themselves. That's the statement of the, the epistle to the Romans about them. The thing is contradictory. Without form, quite void, with warring, fighting elements, that's what produces chaos, isn't it? Don't we use the term in that way? We say about certain situations, the whole place was absolutely chaotic, we say. It may have been in the home when something exceptional was taking place. It may have been at a railway station when there was a breakdown. It may have been an accident on the road. We said everything was in a state of chaos. Things were coming and going somewhere across the road. Everything, we say, is absolutely chaotic. You couldn't make sense or meaning of it. Life, we are told, without Christ is like that. 
And isn't the life of men like that individually? There are warring elements. We want to be good and then we are bad. We decide to be better and we become worse. There is that within us which wants purity. There is that within us which delights in lust. That's chaos. We want to be good and bad at the same time. We want heaven and yet we want hell in this world. Our whole life is chaotic and contradictory and confusing. The whole state of men is that of confusion. And the result of that is, of course, that nothing is produced. While the world, the material elements of the world were like that before God commanded the light to shine out of darkness, there was no grass, nothing grew, there was no life, there was no production. Chaotic the conditions always are unproductive. Nothing can happen because of this contradictory element. Everything fighting against everything else and everything reduced to a state of disorder. And that is the state of men apart from Jesus Christ. Oh, my dear friends, I don't stand here simply to paint pictures. This is a very personal gospel, so I don't hesitate to put this personal question. What's the state of your life at this moment? Is it ordered? Is it whole? Is it guided by reason, by understanding? Is it productive? Do you know where you are? Is there really an objective and a goal in your life? Or are you just the victim of circumstance and chance, the victim of other people and what they do and what they think and what they say? Where is your life? So many people have to admit and to confess, they say, I'm in an awful mess. And they're saying the truth. They say, my life has gone to pieces. I'm in an utterly chaotic condition. And we are told that life apart from Christ is like that. It's darkness and ignorance and it's chaos. And what we are told here is that men in that condition can do nothing whatsoever about it. He cannot, of course, because he is not even aware of it. His ignorance prevents him. But still more, the apostle says here that even if a man were told something about it, he still cannot because, he says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine into them. And there is men, in the darkness, in the ignorance, in the chaos. And I say that he remains there until the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness shines in his heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Haven't we been seeing it as we've looked at the case of this man, Paul? It was there on the road to Damascus. He saw himself and his condition. It was there he saw Christ. And the result was, well, exactly what he tells us here. The first thing that happens is that one is given light. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. What for? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. My dear friend, to be a Christian means that you have received certain knowledge. It isn't merely experience. It is an experience, but it's experience Born of knowledge, light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And that is what had happened to this man. He was given this knowledge, this light, this instruction about himself and his condition and his relationship to God and his utter hopelessness and helplessness. And then, in the face of Jesus Christ, he saw the way out of it all. 
the one who had come to deliver him and to set him free, to bring him pardon and to reconcile him to God. And this is the only hope for the individual and the only hope for the world this night. The light, the knowledge, the understanding that comes and comes alone in and through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul saw him and everything changed. He knew his sins forgiven. He knew he was reconciled to God. He became a child of God. It was the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the atoning death, the resurrection, that gave him the knowledge and all was changed. And it's that that I want to emphasize as I close this evening. The result of knowing and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is that chaos is replaced by order. And what a wonderful thing this is. Order in thought. I said that the man who is not a Christian is lacking in his knowledge, in his ideas about life. But when the light of Christ comes, a man's life becomes ordered and primarily in the matter of thought. One begins to see life steadily and to see it whole. One begins to understand the whole object and purpose of life. One begins to see why things are as they are in this world. One can see now that one's misery and wretchedness and failure are due to sin. Due to the estrangement from God. Due to the influence of the devil, Satan. And one can see that the whole world is as it is because of this activity. So that one is no longer perplexed and find it difficult to understand the state of one's own soul and the state of the whole world. There is an explanation of the world in the Bible and in the Bible alone. But given this light and this knowledge in Christ, given this new life in Christ, Life no longer becomes aimless and pointless. The Christian is a man who sees himself as but a journeyman, as a stranger, a traveler, a sojourner in this life and in this world. He realizes that he's a child of eternity. This isn't the only world. He begins to know about another world, the world about William Pitt, about which William Pitt was so ignorant. The Christian knows about it. Listen to Paul putting it. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What is my secret, says Paul? It's this. I know that I belong to a life and to a world that are unseen. He once knew this world only. He now knows about another. His spiritual eyes have been opened. He saw Christ from heaven. The world of spirit and of reality has been opened to him. This world he sees as a passing world, and it is. Princes, the kings, the great ones of this world, they come and go. Princes and lords may flourish or may fade, a breath can make them as a breath hath made. The Christian has a view of this world and its pomp and its glory and its ceremony. He sees it dying, disappearing. He knows that the boast of heraldry and the pump of power and all that beauty, all that wealth e'er gave, await alike the inevitable hour. The paths of glory lead but to the grave. Great in this world, yes, but it's coming to an end. What then? The Christian knows 
He's seen through this world. He's seen beyond this world. He sees the blessed hope, the heaven of God awaiting him so his life becomes a purposeful life. He says this is the life of contradictions. I don't belong to it. It influences me and I fall. Nevertheless, I'm a child of God. I get up and I go on. This isn't all. This is transient, evanescent. I follow on. I'm with Christ. I'll go after him. His life becomes an ordered life. Did you notice what Paul tells us here about his experience? If ever a man was surrounded by trials and tribulations and troubles, it was this apostle. Read this chapter again and read his list. Everything's going against him, round and about him. Is he chaotic? Not at all. He's in a world of chaos, but he sees straight through it, and he walks straight through it. Though the world around him is chaotic and contradictory, he is in a state of order and of peace. There is a purpose in his life and a goal for his destiny. And the result of all this is, of course, that his life becomes disciplined and controlled. He sees sin for what it is. He doesn't merely see the paint and the powder and the gary signs and all the joviality. He sees the hand of the devil and of hell behind it all. He sees the destruction to which it's leading. The Christian is like Moses, of whom we are told this, that he preferred to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He's disciplined. He's controlled. He sees things for what they are. He sees behind them. He sees the principle involved. So he disciplines. He controls his life. He's searching for holiness and for cleanliness and purity. And at the center of it all, he's enjoying a great peace. He knows something about a peace of God that passeth all understanding, of which the world can never rob him. It can despise him, it can persecute him, it can laugh at him, it can throw him into prisons, it can execute him. Still he has this peace. He knows where he's going. He knows in whom he has believed. The order, the discipline remain. He is no longer a victim of circumstance and chance. He cares not what the so-called slings and arrows of outrageous fortune may do to him. There's a plan in his life. There's an order in his being. He sees things clearly. He's got his eye on the invisible realities. He says the things that are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. And he keeps his gaze steadfastly fixed upon them. And on he goes. What's the cause of it all? It is the light that has shined out of darkness. He has had a knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He is a man who says to himself, the one thing that matters to me is my relationship to God. Men and women round and about me will all be soon dead as I shall be dead myself. I care not that they laugh at me in the office tomorrow morning. I care not that I may lose my professional status, that I become a pauper. I care not. Let the whole world mock and laugh and jeer. If I'm right with God... All is well with my soul. That's the position of the Christian. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ has reduced the chaos to order, the formless void waste has become a garden of the Lord, a paradise within his central innermost being. My dear friend, is that your condition? I can put it all in one question. 
is the one big thing in your life at this moment. Your relationship to God. That's the test. If that is not central, if that isn't the biggest thing in your mind and in your life, well then I say, you have not had the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And if you haven't, this is what Paul says about you. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. Once this light comes and gives a man knowledge of God, he desires nothing else. That is everything. That is all. And in Christ, it is shining in this world tonight. He came into it nearly 2,000 long years ago. It's shining in the babe of Bethlehem. It's shining in the boy at the age of 12 there in the temple. It's shining in the young man who begins to preach at the age of 30. It's shining in all its radiance and its glory from the cross. It's shining even in the grave and on the resurrection morn. It is shining in this world still through the operation of the Holy Spirit. My dear friend, have you seen it even here tonight? That is all I'm called to do, to stand here and allow this light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ to pass through me to you. It's my privilege to be a little lamp and nothing else. Have you seen the light of God upon yourself and your relationship to him? Yea, I ask you, have you seen the light in the face of Christ, which tells you that though you may have been dark and ignorant and sinful and vile and lost until this moment, that in him you can be saved and redeemed, your sins forgiven, reconciled to God, made a child of God, and given a glimpse of the glory that awaits you. And you'll be able to become like Paul. And the chaos will be replaced by order. And you'll march in the light of this glorious knowledge. Whatever may happen in the world round and about you. Amen.